please note that this video contains spoilers for the subject and the series and or franchise leading up to this entry. Put off by how long this video is, don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. The Matrix Revolutions Movie Thoughts In the first movie, the machines were shown as cold and inhuman. And inhumane, for that matter. Morpheus says that as long as the Matrix exists, humanity will never be free. They made us all slaves, unconscious slaves at that. They literally objectify our very bodies. They, they turn us into something they can use for their benefit. The, the, the dead are fed intravenously to the living. This is about as disgusting and as dehumanizing as it gets. It's, it's, it's somewhat comparable to how we view Skynet, or for a non-robotic one, the Galactic Empire. Partially robotic one. And in those franchises, you do feel like the this evil group is defeated. It might not be exactly the way you expected it to look, but at the end of the ga the end of the day, the good guys beat the bad guys. And here, you know, the the comics and the animatrix spend a little bit of time setting up that, you know, kind of kind of flipping it to to. Yeah, to, to where we can more appreciate it. maybe there's some humanity to the, yeah. But really, the, the, both of those still do spend a lot of time, you know, it's still very, very evil, kind of, yeah. And then Reloaded, you know, points out we depend on some machines to live. And then here, you know, when Neo wakes up, they become as humanized as possible. Excuse me, we literally, we don't know right away that she's a program, but we're literally staring at a cute little girl who says cute little girl things in cute little girl ways as a cute little girl. It's and and then we're we're you know we're told programs machines can still love and have children. That's as human as it gets. It's it doesn't get more humanizing, and it's just it's way too big of a shift. Maybe they thought that we'd be confused if we in one saw that we humans did, you know did something awful to the machines as well. The, the only thing we're told in one that gives us any kind of, you know, places any blame on us of what we have, you know, of the situation, is that we blackened the sky. Maybe they changed their minds between making this one and then, you know, between making the first one and then these two. But at the end of the first movie, by the end, we expect, among other things, that the good humans will win over the evil machines, and then this movie says that that is completely wrong-headed, that you know, it's you know, even even thinking of it in those terms is completely wrong-headed. Now, I respect that 
it would be difficult to follow up to, to you know what what do you do how you know the the winning of of the conflict set up in one what do you do with billions of people leaving the matrix we we already know that life on the surface is extremely difficult even you know hypothetically let's say that somehow humanity mostly destroyed the machines did you know their defense grid was smashed it was just about even if there are still a few it's still a real uphill battle with that many human beings the the you know where where do you take all these people you know as with without sun on the surface and with the machines even if there were a few you know i'm talking about if you know if if the if it hadn't ended with this shaky truce peace then what you know would would you just try to relocate to you know to up above the machines would have a really easy time of finding us and you know billions of people who need to learn how to use their muscles whose muscles need to be you know grown back to properly you know we what we see happen to neo after he gets freed this takes days it you know how would you get enough you know it, i guess you'd have to free them all extremely slowly and then gradually you you know the people who've been freed can then help free others and help you know help with this kind of medical it's it's a process you know and yeah you know if you if you go onto the surface you have to then also be ready to defend yourself and maybe build some kind of defense there while you have all these people that are just now learning how the world is even you know how do you move all these people from the pods to wherever they're going to live you know the, in the first one we see neo flushed out of the pod they can't live in the sewer so they have to be moved from there you know how do you even set up a system to move all these people from the sewers or you know wherever how you know wouldn't the machines catch on if you if you build a system that you know okay so that person's gonna and we're gonna have someone ready to pick them up when they get flushed you know wouldn't the machines then block those paths and really easily take out the people who are trying to rescue the ones being unplugged but these are problems they should have solved you know the Wachowskis should have solved before writing the first one if they intended to show an ending of that you know where yeah where humanity humanity gets freed I'm not claiming that I have the solution but I don't write multi-million dollar blockbusters those who do take on the responsibility of fixing the issues that these blockbusters bring up you have to give some kind of closure and at the end of the first one we felt like we had that we didn't know exactly how Neo was going to be able to yeah you know but he can stop the gatekeepers that you know we know that much Morpheus says they are the gatekeepers and he can you know the, the agents are and Neo can easily defeat the agents now so that must be a really big you know but yeah it's basically the the I guess they would have to prevent the machines from interfering with the pods and then one by one unplug these people gradually and then start the process of healing them so that they can you know be and gradually building a bit like we're, we know that Zion holds 250,000 people that's not the same as you know five or six billion you know depending on yeah so yeah
I didn't try the MMORPG since I don't... I rarely play RPGs to begin with. Not a huge fan of like playing online, playing with other people. I, I just prefer single player and playing with a ton of people. It's, yeah, just not at all for me. I do like the idea. I, I've, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail here because I, I would literally just be, you know, stating things that I read on Wikipedia. But I, you know, if you're at all interested in how it was, you can't play it anymore because massively online, which again, that's part of what I don't like about it. I don't like not being able to play a game when I want to play it. So, you know, even years down, I, I just replayed Half-Life, for example. If that was on, if that was online, back, yeah, the first one, not this, yeah. So, since I'm going to be reviewing Shadow Warrior 2013, and I played it in part to kind of remind myself what was, you know, what were first-person shorts like in the late 90s, and it was an excuse to replay Half-Life. It holds up. It's, they did a really good job on that game. But, yeah, I, if, if you're at all interested in this kind of thing, in the idea of it, you know, check out the wiki page for The Matrix Online. The, the classes and the organizations, it makes a lot of sense. The, the, they could really do some, yeah. And I do understand why having a game like that, where you could actually help shape the continuing story of The Matrix, yeah, you know, you need, excuse me, you need The Matrix still running. But it does mean that we didn't get a real ending. And, you know, that's not okay. I, I can't even imagine playing the game without having a bitter taste in my mouth from the fact that this even exists, you know, means that 3 didn't get a proper ending. Even, again, I don't know if that was... I can appreciate that that might not have been the idea. I do think that part of the idea was they didn't really want to make a movie that was let's destroy this group of thinking beings you know whatever you think about machines being you know equal to humans or and these are clearly very complex thinking you know the the in the first one, they're they're almost set up the like the kind of invading alien force kind of thing, you know. In that, you you tend not to worry too much about beating them back because this is our world, our world. But yeah, at the end of the day, with all these machines and how complex they are, yeah, the Wachowskis didn't want to be making a movie that said if there's a big group. Even if it's true, to, I mean, they're, they're, you know, the, they're doing that, crap, what's he called, leader, South America came out after a lot, of, you know, and said, we have to forgive our enemies. I understand that, and I, I, in theory, I appreciate it. I, I definitely, I don't think we should ever appro approach a real-life conflict with the idea that we have to destroy this other group of people. Yeah, we have to destroy this group of thinking, you know, like thinking on a very high level. You know, no matter what, we should try to live and, you know, to have a peaceful coexistence with them. But that's just not what the first movie leaves us on. Not not by a long shot. They, they've done so much to demonize them, and, yeah. So, so, yeah, like I said, it's, it's possible that it wasn't, they might have just said, well, since we're going to leave the, the trilogy off like that, we could also make a game. You know, it might have been that. But, you know, it's, it's not like with Enter the Matrix. I'm pretty sure The Matrix Online started in 2005, so, you know, 
they didn't it wasn't like if you you know if you just watch the movie then you could also play the game you know you, people had to wait for a little while to to get to play it at all and you know that's probably also part of why it did so poorly you know shut down at you know yeah was probably the people weren't exactly in love with two and three but then also yeah how can you how can you play it for a single second without thinking the fact that this exists you know the it may not have been the reason that three didn't have an ending but it exists and three didn't have an ending and those two things are in some way connected you know no matter which came first the yeah maybe it was oh hey since we're gonna end the, the trilogy like this we could also make a game but yeah we we do see more machine world robots and they're all kind of you know they they have insect like designs designs among other you know which makes sense because in nature insects are incredibly efficient and that is what the machines would want to emulate then you know like the the idea that robots would walk around and look like humans you know different you know different sci-fi authors have come up with different ideas for why but part of it would be to make us more comfortable around them you know and yeah the the if if the machines are just making more machines just to to do various tasks then it makes sense that they you know why would they impersonate the human you know the the human form works for what the what we do but you know there are a lot of different tasks to to undertake that don't where where it would be more beneficial to have you know maybe have a small body that can get in to to certain places and yeah when you know i yeah i think it was before this came out when when reloaded had come out and people went back and rewatched the first one and such and noted that evidently the architect was watching neo when he you know when he was being interrogated people figured that maybe the phone call at the end of one was actually taking place at the end of revolutions and was to the architect and you know that would mean that the the you know you we know that the, that call takes place 19 months after the the start of the first movie and reload and revolutions take place 6 months after the events of the first movie so yeah, you know, that just means that there's 13 months in there somewhere as well. I do like that once Morpheus realizes that the Oracle lied, he's, he comes to believe in Neo, the person, which Niobe does as well. He, you know, it 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 would be so easy just to you know, either just leave him like that, leave him not believing in anyone at all, or, you know, have him just refuse to accept that it was a lie, but instead he's given this growth. You know, before, when he looked at Neo, he basically saw the savior. You know, he's, this is, yeah, where, you know, now he sees a person who might still be able, you know, so, yeah. And it's also in part through that that he, you know, accepts that they're not to destroy the machines. And, you know, when he actually puts the gun down and goes, it's really like, even if he's certain 
that they're not going to attack him like Locke is right there. You know, he very early in reloaded, he was like, is Locke going, you know, am I going to be escorted to the stockade? You might be after this. And the fact that Bane leaves the medical area, the, the yeah, that section of the hammer is purely through contrivances. When he sits there and he literally just spells out, you know, in front of all of them, spells out what is going on. And then he says it to the one person they left in there, you know. Roland, the, the captain of the hammer, says after they find, I, I want to say she's named Maggie, after they find her dead, he says, I should have beaten it out of him. I understand his rage, but, you know, torture is going a bit far. However, why didn't you just have someone guard the, like, excuse me, he, the fact that Bane was the one survivor, that by itself made him suspect him, which you know, makes sense. The fact that, you know, then he has these cuts, then he's, you know, acting all weird. Yeah, it's just, it's ridiculous that they let him. And I mean, I don't know that it really had to be like that, couldn't? Neo and Trinity end up taking the Logos, Niobe's ship, away. She, Niobe gives Neo her ship to, you know, because she believes in him. Couldn't Bane have just gotten from, like, yeah, they, they find the Logos. Well, yeah, actually, the, the, the Logos is in a different spot than the, you know, yeah, it, it, it hid in a different spot than the other ships are, but I don't know, could he maybe have piloted one, if he took one of those ships and flew, I mean, if, I don't know, I'm not certain you can fly it completely alone, but hypothetically, Let's just say that somehow he flew that, he got close to the Logos, but it didn't, you know, and and then, he, actually, yeah, I suppose it would always be pretty contrived, but it's just, how about this, it didn't really need to happen, Neo could have gotten blinded some other way if that was the, the big deal there. Once Bane triggers the EMP, he's done what he needed to do. That's the, you know, one, he, he sabotaged his own ship and, you know, he killed everyone. Then he fired the EMP with a lot of people still in range. You know, more or less only Roland and the Hammer made it out. And, you know, the Logos was somewhere else entirely. So... Yeah, couldn't he have just died there and just come to think of it? Yeah, then they look for survivors and they don't find any, but they do find Bane and they say those wounds are definitely self-inflicted and yeah, maybe, maybe Smith tells some other person that or maybe, maybe the Oracle they're at the start of the movie, when when Neo first sees the Oracle. Well, yeah, yeah, the one time he sees the Oracle in the movie. How about he, she just says, Smith took over one of yours, and then he looks to the side and goes, Bane, there you go. It's, it's really, like, we're sitting there, we're so frustrated with the characters as Bane is, yeah. I appreciate that the train man borns away behind the train, which was, of course, a pointless action scene. 
and a remarkably uninspired one. I really feel like it didn't need to take place in the Matrix. It didn't need to have any badass characters. And it really didn't need to happen. Like, if, you know, the, the, why didn't, why wasn't the, the trip to the Oracle just, you'll need the train man, but to get the train man, you have to go to the Merovingian. There you go. That's it. We don't know if all programs are golden to Neo. You know, we only really see him look at Seraph through that. I, I figured that maybe, you know, we, we do see when Smith takes over the Oracle, we see some of that in code, but, you know, is, is that if the, you know, isn't it only to Neo that Seraph is gold when he looks at the world in code? Because nobody else says, why is this Seraph dude in, in gold instead of in green code like everything and everyone else? And, you know, given the name, yeah, it, there could be some, you know, they, they say he doesn't have his wings anymore. And I do appreciate that, you know, the machines are made of light. Everything living is made of light to Neo, as he ultimately appreciates. And that's part of how this... Well, they are they are living, thinking beings as well. You know that's part of how that works, and that's that of course has philosophical significance. That if you know that living beings are made of light, imbued with energy, yeah, that kind of thing. And the you know the whole chosen one kind of narrative is a really old trope and you know them even using it in the first one you know back then when we just thought he is the chosen one he will actually you know it seemed like they were just using that trope very conventionally but then reloaded tells us that it was just another another form of control and it makes sense you know if you tell that's that's how that you know a lot of systems of control if there are a lot of people that have to be controlled what you do is you you feed them a lie that calms them down or you turn them against someone that they shouldn't be fighting either way you you have them focus on something other than what, you know, if they think that, you know, hypothetically, let's say that maybe they were just flying around trying to free as many minds as they possibly could, that might be a problem for the machines if they're really, really good at it. And, yeah, when you when you then tell them, no, no, this, this one guy, he's super important. Don't worry about anyone else. You know, then, yeah. But, you know, turned out to be what absolutely nobody wanted to see. In the... You know, it takes Neo forever to realize that Bane is actually Smith. Which, you know, there's a lot about Bane that everybody mocked right from when this came out. How obviously he's Smith, you know, the fact that he gets out of this, you know, so safely, the, the convenience of him, you know, he only cut the left hand before he wished good luck and the, yeah. Now, in the in at least one of the trailers, you see Neo sighted in a in a bit where he's 
or maybe they used a clip from a little earlier on, but I'm pretty sure there's at least one bit where he's actually blind, but in the trailer it looks as though he isn't. Maybe it's just the fact that he can suddenly see Smith's fire. Yeah. I appreciate that his, you know, it, briefly, in, in part they, you know, they want to hide the twist, but they also postponed the disappointment. But yeah, the, the, I appreciate that Smith's, you know, his, his just being, you know, his energy has the sunglasses as well. But, you know, I, I get that, yeah, it is something that, you know, you, you could say the same thing about, oh, his hair is, you know, more or less the, the same way in his facial, you know, but nevertheless, it, it does look slightly goofy with, with the sunglasses there. Would, would sunglasses even help for someone who's made of light? Bane, you know, Ian Bliss does a fantastic impersonation of Hugo Weaving, and he also looks a lot like him. They, you know, that was why they cast him, and yeah, it really, they, they really nailed that, and he nailed that. Nobody really wants to see Neo stuck in limbo for the first portion of the film, much less beaten up by a homeless man. As the critics point out, the moment that you see the kid, you either know you know that either he's going to save the day or he's going to die. It's you know, it's that conventional. You know, when, as I've said before in these videos, the first movie broke, you know, went, again, went against a lot of conventions. And he's one of the last people that we see, you know, and when he aims as Neo, I believe. Man, that was... And that didn't even mean anything to people who hadn't watched the Animatrix, because that's where that, yeah. You know, he's like, the war is over, let's stop all the fighting. You know, how could he be sure that it wasn't like a malfunction or maybe a temporary delay in a signal or something? I wonder who in Machine City is like responsible for, you know, like like the, the IT, you know, the, the person who has to run around and actually fix when something's wrong. He, dude must really have his hands full. The... about the kid I I really don't hate the 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 actor himself it's the character it's the writing and the direction I feel like in years from now he's gonna get a really great role and he's gonna nail it and either he's going to be forgiven by most people for playing the kid or people are never going to forgive him for yeah the you know trinity catching the gun is really badass in both Enter the Matrix and here, they must really have loved the line. It's said that, you know, she fought her well, her way through, you know, to get... She really didn't. She kind of just stand off in, you know, in, through most of the club itself. I do really appreciate the button on the elevator. That's a quite nice detail. But really, the only thing they that she really fought her way through was the, you know, the coat check area, the, the lobby. And some have said that, oh, you know, Monica Bellucci doesn't get to say anything. She, she doesn't say a lot verbally, but her eyes expressed quite a bit. And, yeah, she wouldn't be in the movie if she wasn't, you know, rather attractive. But she does actually, you know, 
her performance in both Reloaded and this is really good. It's not like she's... They didn't cast someone really attractive who can't act, you know, and they could have. The... You know, and, and when she says, you know, Trinity is in love, the way I see it, it's, you know, she can, she can see it on, you know, well, yeah, more or less says. It's, it's not the fact that she kissed Neo and thus she knows their love. No, it's, yeah, it's from reading her. And in spite of Trinity's stoic facade, I do think she does a pretty good job of the, the, yeah, conveying that. And evidently the Wachowskis cannot end a Matrix film without killing Neo and or Trinity. You know, I mean, you might not have thought so at the end of Reloaded. He was clearly able to stop people from dying. And Trinity takes forever to die. Why does Neo have to spend? Well, I get why. It's it's you know quiet reflection by himself. But Neo spending himself all that time forever figuring out how he's going to win. Why couldn't that time have been spent with Trinity? With excuse me, we would have gotten some meaningful lines. Excuse me. See why they love each other. Why they need you know that they need each other. That you know only in you know, own, you know, the the two of them talk, and gradually he realizes what to do, and only because of that. But no, instead, it's just, you know, when when he comes out and says, "I need time," we are just as frustrated as Roland is. You know, in in the first movie, Neo was very much this self-insert fantasy for, yeah, and very intentionally so. It's not like it just happened to be. I, I think Smith, you know, the, the, the fact that everybody loved Smith so much, thus them bringing him back, they, they might not have realized how much we were going to love Smith, but they knew that what they were doing with Neo and him being the protagonist and everything, yeah, they knew that we were going to enjoy that. And then, you know, some in Reloaded, but especially in this, what happens to him is not at all what, you know, yeah, what, what we want to happen to us. The way I see it on agents taking over people, you know, they're there are different takes on how that works. The way I see it, basically in the mega city, only, you know, as far as we see, there's only three agents at a time. And each agent can only take over one person at a time. And then when that person dies, or if it's just no longer that useful, then they will leave that person again. And the... I'm not sure you see much in the movies someone, you know, having been taken over by an agent, that agent then leaving that. But you do see it in Enter the Matrix. I believe it's, you know, Ghost is just about to snipe an agent, or he's definitely got him in his sights. He may just be watching. And then that agent, you know, jumps out of that. And I do realize, especially as big and you know I mean in the first one you never actually see like a freeway you don't see that much and they, they're always only in these dark abandoned areas which is safer because the agents are less you know there are fewer people and the moment a person sees one of them especially sees them doing something weird the agents might you know pick up on that and basically you know some ask why didn't like the the yeah for example why didn't the what why didn't the agents jump into neo in the car when you know when they've got the gun on him and everything 
the you know you you see something similar happen in the animatrix in detective in a detective story trinity is trying to free this one person and then he you know starts becoming an agent part of it is that they thought that they could get more out of neo if he was alive and not an agent they bugged him after all they you know another thing is just that they wouldn't really be able to get much out of Neo if they just if they took him over right there in the car you know switch would shoot him in the head before he became an agent that's not and, and we do know that shoot a shot in the head an agent will die from what kills the human host it's just that they can bend the rules so much that they're very difficult to kill by things that you know wouldn't normally kill a human being and the you know yeah as as such and i'd say it's a stretch too that there's only you know only three agents for that many but then a lot of the time the you know the police and SWAT are enough you know it's it's not just any rebel who can you know outrun SWAT and the like and actually yeah actually need agents the the agents are you know when it's when when you know exactly where the rebel is and when the they're they're going right up. and yeah you know you never see a lot of rebels in a lot of different places in the movies although i don't know i guess if there really are only three agents maybe maybe there's a certain amount like this, a certain stretch of land in that land there's only the three and then when you go beyond that so that if say four different rebel ships were in four different parts as long as these are significantly different parts and they don't intersect then the agents can be you know we don't we don't see anything that directly confirms or denies that theory so I would say that that's you know and yeah, you know, the it's it's kind of computer thinking. They don't they don't necessarily feel like they have to have a huge net out for the, you know. And you know, when when rebels go into the matrix, you know, when they hack into the matrix or when they leave the matrix, basically you have to have the the hard line, a, a phone line that you know yeah it's simply what you you can't go into the matrix from you know if if you're not if you're not in a pod you can't enter the matrix without you know going through a phone line and you can't leave the matrix without going through a phone line as well and then you know the moment that you know as I've already gone into when when an agent when when a human being sees something weird that goes directly to the the agents like again let's go with that they have that specific section to to you know protect against the the rebels that goes directly to their earpiece and then they take over that person and they can also take over anyone they want any time without just having but they're not going to do it just if if they don't think there's a rebel there then they're not going to do it but say the the one that morpheus f fights that he sacrificed himself to fight smith that's because they just found out where in the building you know they they knew that they were on the 8th floor because they traced the, the phone they call the call because it was so close and because they knew they were in there but then they had to figure out where on the eighth floor and the moment one of them found it you know he just at first he shoots at Neo and then he backs away I can imagine that Smith waited intentionally because if Neo was shooting at the guy and then Smith took him over he's standing right there and ready to be shot so yeah 
and they the the agents lose nothing by going into and out of a host it's just that they can only be inside one host at a time but in one we do see them gunned down and immediately after taking over other people now inevitable is again said by smith and again has no nothing like the effect that it did in the first one and Neo looks like he's beaten, and in this he's nowhere near as dusty as he was in the subway fight, but nevertheless, he, you know, he's down, he gets up, and there's, you know, it's this kind of old building, and, you know, yeah, he, he does the stance similar to the end of the subway fight. I should maybe briefly go into the, the rebels, in part, at least some of them, we know that Morpheus does, have just straight up you know, they are wanted by the police. They're, they're, you know, having just rewatched, I can confirm, I, I wasn't sure when I, you know, did the videos on one, but having just rewatched at least once, Morpheus is generally, you know, he's called a known terrorist. So they, yeah, the, the moment that one of the rebels, or at least one of the very well-known rebels is seen then, you know, like, regular people might not be able to recognize them, but if just a regular cop sees one of them, he's going to call for backup and try to fight them. In part because of that, and in part because they do things that if normal people see them, they'll go right to the earpiece of the closest agent, you know, they try to stay in, you know, these abandoned areas where there aren't going to be a lot of people around, that, you know, can, yeah, can see them, that, you know, can call police, that can be taken over by agents one by one, yeah. So, the, you know, in, in the movies and in the game, in the Matrix, you usually see them showing up and leaving through these old abandoned kind of areas that do have at least one working phone. And if the phone is destroyed, as we see, you know, in the subway, Trinity gets through, but then the, you know, part of the phone receiver is destroyed. That means they can't travel back through and out through the main line and back out to the ship. When... You know, when, when Smith grabs Neo, and I want to say it's called a pile driver, it kind of just looks like a hug. He really did miss him. And, you know, and he asks, why do you persist? And then Neo says, because I choose to. That's, that's not the why, that's, that's, he... Yes, you choose to, and so you keep fighting. That's, that's, you might say, that, you know, if he, if he didn't choose to, he wouldn't keep fighting. That is, that's part of the process. But he's asking, why did you make that choice? And, yeah. The... You know, I appreciate that Neo is the one and Smith is the many, so they, they are opposites. And, you know, when they swap places in the air, they, you know, make up, make up the yin-yang symbol, switching places, so they're both, you know, both of them are both yin and yang. And, you know, this is the philosophers who point this out. And the... You know, in actuality, the from from start to end, the burly, the super burly brawl, the the climactic fight between Smith and Neo, really isn't that long. It's just that so much of it is stuff that we don't really want to see. We we wanted to see another fight like the subway fight. We wanted to see just a lot of martial arts between them, and preferably just one Smith, not the the burly brawl and reloaded. You know, but yeah. It, it just feels really long. 
And I'd say the, the best parts of the fight is when you can see their faces and the practical, the, the martial arts and such. When they just use effects to put in the environment. And I do think that it makes decent enough sense that, you know, the, the Oracle Smith, when Smith took her over, he gained at least some of her ability to see at least some of the future, and thus he saw him defeating Neo, and then, you know, and then saying something, and then the Oracle says, and, you know, maybe it's that she still had just enough control over herself, maybe, you know, Yeah, maybe maybe like fate took over or something, but you know, it 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 did tell him. I, yeah, I do think that it makes fine enough sense that he doesn't attack Neo with all of them. He already tried that and it didn't work. But now that he's seen that he beats Neo and how he beats him, yeah, and the the yeah, you know, she needed to tell Neo that you know, the path of the one has ended and that, yeah, you know, this is this is how it should end. Now, I've already somewhat gone into that, you know, Neo seeing the the life, the, the soul of the machines and such, you know, wasn't very satisfying for, you know, it's, we didn't really want to see them play nice with each other and form a truce, you know, and And when he's like, you know, he f he's lying in the form of a cross when he, yeah, and the, you know, he vomits a light and the, the smiths explode in light, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it works as allegory, but it really isn't a satisfying, you know, conclusion to the fight and really, you know, It, it seemed like Neo was ready to go on fighting, you know, he, it's, it's possible that he might have eventually won, but I, I appreciate that, you know, him lying across and the, the light stuff, it's not just Jesus' imagery, there's, you know, there are other allegories, philosophical ideas in there, but to most Western viewers, he's just Jesus. You, if, if you wanted to, to invoke those other ideas, you, you really had to do use something other than just the image. Just, you know, have maybe maybe have the the yeah, maybe maybe someone needs to use a password or something, and it is the you know the name of one of those gods or something to just you know you can you can get creative with something like that but when we just see a guy in a cross and then there's light to most that's just Jesus you know and the and you know even if you know can appreciate I I respect putting in a lot of religious ideas that aren't very common in mainstream movies in, you know for, for a Western audience but then you have to make it clear that those are the, and as you know if you're just showing us Jesus imagery you had plenty of that you know I mean this wasn't as bad as you know Man of Steel was you know he literally is Jesus in that movie but which, most of the way but in in yeah you know with with just this 
yeah, we, we didn't really want to see Jesus' imagery on the hero. We've seen that a million times before. Now, when Neo and Smith, you know, is it is it because, you know, when when Smith clones himself into Neo, you know, is it because they merge? Is it that they cancel each other out? Is it maybe that Deus Ex Machina sends like an antivirus program or deletes the Smith program through, you know, it's it's not quite clear and maybe it's one, maybe it's all of these. I think that they should have had some line that just, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't fix things, but it would help a lot if you just said, you know, loading antivirus software or you know, just, just something. But, you know, if it was one of these things, you know, if it was Deus Ex Machina, it must have been that Neo was special somehow because it was there were countless of people plugged into the matrix that Smith had taken over. Surely he could send through one of them. And, you know, while I agree that Smith probably would say it's not fair, him saying that the end of the fight is not fair is kind of funny because he's not really the type who fights fair. And I appreciate, you know, Smith and Neo run and punch, you know, run at each other and start punching at the same time. And, you know, in a way it is that Smith starts this violence and Neo, you know, because they are each other's opposites, they, you know, their movements mimic, what, you know, I mean, they're at the start, you know, one of them could have chosen to fly at the other instead of running. You know, or start with a kid. You know, yeah. There, there are, and the, you know, it's, excuse me, it's the one time where Neo, in either of these sequels, actually, you know, is the one that engages in the violence, not not waiting for the other. You know, with with the train man, he even offers payment, like, you know. After going through that, he says one way or another, I'm getting on this train. He's He thinks that he can beat the train man as he usually can, you know, anyone in within the Matrix. But, you know, before that, he says, I will pay you. You know, I mean, he's he's been told that, you know, he knows that this is not a good guy. So it's not, you know, it's not necessarily that he wants to, but he's saying... You know, I don't want to fight you, you know, and the, the, you know, the, the upgraded agents, he waits for them to attack him. The exiles in the chateau, he waits for them to shoot. You know, if he wanted to, he could have just, like, run at them and attack them, you know, or whatever. But he, he lets them attack. He, you know, I could imagine that if they had turned around and run away he wouldn't have followed them. And, you know, the, the burly brawl, he waits for Smith to try to infect him. And... Why doesn't Trinity just lock Bane in the, you know, just lock the... the yeah, the, the lid thing. She just kicked him from the ladder. She kicked him in the head. He fell all the way down. I buy that he gets up in the time that in in the time between him falling down and her getting to the radio and, and him being behind her. I buy that. But if she had kicked him down, then immediately closed the the thing and done you know it takes him two seconds once he you know after he has her as a hostage and he throws her down and starts finding neo yeah i would not have believed you know well yeah i don't believe that you know that smith would ever use the word bitch that's just yeah he's he doesn't yeah. 
which, you know, in case, yeah, Bane says that to her. I appreciate, you know, when he says, you know, oh, I, you know, I have, I chased you time after time, you know, I, he, he doesn't say something like that to Neo because they didn't know each other for that long. Neo wasn't important to the, the agents at all before the, the start of the first movie. You know, by then, you know, Trinity had been active for years before that, so Smith had chased her plenty of times, but he doesn't chase Neo for that, you know, that much in the... And... She says that it took her 10 minutes to buckle up one boot. In her defense, she lacks depth perception and flying motor skills. That is such a dumb line. And the, you know, six hours ago, do you know what changed? Nothing. Just, yeah. The bag that Neo grabs to carry into the train gets left in limbo. I mean, couldn't the, couldn't one of them at least grab it and bring it in or something? Just, yeah. When when Neo, you know, he's he's talking to Roland and he says, "I need the, the ship. You know, I still have to go." I, you know, if if you imagine that he's talking about going to the bathroom, that scene gets a lot funnier. And someone says, "Up we go." That's what you say when you, you know, lift a child into your arms or something. The the critics point out that Roland. It's ridiculous that he still doesn't believe in Neo. Neo stopped Sentinels with his hands. He, you know, yeah, he, he psychic powered them away. The fact that he doesn't believe in the one, that's one thing. But when they literally tell him Neo raised his hand and stopped Sentinels, do they, does he not believe that? Does he think that they're, that they can't, that, that they would lie about that, or that they'd imagine that. There's, like, forget what he does inside the Matrix. Okay, whatever, Roland doesn't think that's impressive enough. He doesn't believe in the, the prophecy. Clearly, Neo has special powers. You know, it's, it's one of those cases where, in a science fiction or fantasy story, it's not about faith anymore. You can see that this, this individual or entity or group has powers that you don't have it you know it makes sense to accept them and it's it's no longer a matter of faith it's just accepting that that's how it is now and they also note that you know both Roland and Commander Locke don't believe in the prophecy, and you really didn't need two separate characters to do that. I like that Neo only uses guns in the first one because he got it out of his system by carrying gajillion ones in the lobby shootout, I guess. But yeah, you know, it makes sense that he, you know, he doesn't need guns anymore. He can, he can fly. He can stop bullets with his hand. You know. Yeah, he's not gonna need, yeah. And I do, I greatly prefer when in the Matrix, you know, they use guns that fire just project, you know, just bullets and such and melee. You know, I, I don't, I think it's, yeah, I, I'm just, I'm not as big a fan of when they go to like grenades and other explosives as they do in Enter the Matrix and other. There used to be this Half-Life mod called It's right on the tip of my tongue. Anyway, but yeah, it was basically you know, it was essentially this is, you know, I'm not it's not the opera, but anyway, it's it's basically a John Woo movie or like you know, not quite the Matrix because it doesn't have that, but it, you know, it recreates a John Woo, it's, it's like, it's, it's a shooter set in a John Woo, you know, universe, yeah, in, in that kind of world, and it even has 
the the you know the golden duel yeah from face off so and Castor Troy as a you know you can play as Castor Troy the the physical appearance there's no like class system in there but yeah you know the the in that the only explosive is that you can pick up one grenade you can only carry one grenade at a time and then you you know you can throw that grenade but that's it there's no other explosives you don't you know in a lot of shooters it's you know it's a multiplayer sh first person shooter in a lot of those you have other explosive weapons but in that one they say no because this is about people firing guns at each other and you know you can dual wield pistols you can run around with you know just a few small you know yeah bullet firing weapons but that's it and yeah, I definitely prefer that. When the Z when the Sentinels attack Zion, we don't see them use the the cutting laser as much. You know, they use it on, you know, when they they do use it on the hammer and such, but yeah, when it's just you know, I I appreciate that it doesn't it doesn't make as much sense. Excuse me, you know where would they use it when when they attack the APUs? You know they they like they grab it and pull it down or like you know attack the the person's body with the claws or such. But yeah, you know they don't use the laser much, and really that was. In, in the first movie, that was what made them, the, the as far as abilities, that was what made them the biggest threat. If they could only grab on and, like, pull, you know, they're not going to tear through the hull just by pulling. They need a cutting laser. But, yeah, you know, I why don't they just throw bombs through the, the hole that they dug? You know, once they've dug the hole, it makes sense that they dig the hole. You know, don't don't use explosives to try to get down there. No, use the digger. It makes perfect sense. The yeah, but you know, and and yes, I know that throwing the bombs. Although you know, near Machine City, they actually do have like artillery. So I don't know why they couldn't imagine if they sent a single ship just close to the hole, and then it shot bombs the way it does at Neo. Again, they, you know, the, the, them throwing bombs at all was introduced and reloaded. And I was going to say, they shouldn't have done that, which actually shouldn't have introduced it there, if then now, for the attack on Zion, we have to pretend like the machines don't have bombs. But then when Neo and Trinity reach Machine City, then they start firing bombs through there, and then, you know, the moment that they crash, suddenly they're not attacking you anymore for some reason. You know, it's not like he already, he didn't already make his proposal, you know, are, are they just, did they think he was that, you know, that much more dangerous looking just because he was in a ship? You know, he's, he's still, this is still the person who can reach out with, you know, who can, psychically destroy the the yeah anyway but yeah in that scene you see them fire them like that so now we also have to pretend that the machines don't have that could they not have built a, you know a, a machine roughly the size of the digger fly it close to the bottom of the hole and then start firing let's say they can't let's say they still have to throw them at an angle and you know do the the whippy thing with the sentinel as we see them do when they throw bombs in reloaded and enter the matrix yes they throw them at an angle and yes you you know i'm you know it doesn't seem like they can necessarily go that far but just fly close to the bottom of that hole and then start throwing them you know you could you could still do that without getting so close that, you know, the APUs don't shoot up the hole. They shoot at everything that comes right through the hole immediately when it comes right through the hole. You know, if you throw some bombs, let's, let's hypothetically say that the, the first few bombs just get shot and just explode. 
it's still gonna, you know, well, I suppose, yeah, if they throw a lot right after each other, then they might all blow up, but, the, the yeah, those bombs still fly really fast, why, you know, can't throw them in different directions down, in, at different angles down the hole, then, you know, they'll actually then, blowing them up, will just widen the hole that the machines would have to, and then gradually there's going to be a big enough hole that you can start throwing bombs so fast, you know, just have enough different sentinels throwing bombs individually, because that's we do see that they don't need more than one sentinel to throw the bomb. So just one per bomb, and we know they have enough bombs, they shoot tons of them at Neo and Trinity, it's just, you know, the, they've apparently destroyed it six times before and he said we've gotten you know we're really really good at it and still they just send a ton of sentinels like that honestly given that they have bombs why not just dig almost down to the you know so that there's a very small like bit of of you know I don't know exactly. Let's just go with steel. Very small bit of steel, just just a few meters thick or something between the the where the dock starts. You know, the the air above the dock and there and where they're digging. Throw a bomb on that. The the APUs aren't going to be able to do anything about that bomb. It's going to blow. You know, the the like later in the fight, the they blow the shaft. Why, if if you blow the very top of the, you know, of the dome, as it were, above the docks, it's just going to crash down onto them. Isn't that much more effective? Now, the... And the attack on Zion really is the Wachowskis having their cake and eating it too. Ultimately, neither side wins. It's a ticking clock. Neo has to get to, you know, to Machine City and, you know, then strike the deal. Because the moment he strikes the deal, then they pause until that fight. That's also really, like, wouldn't you fly at least a little bit away? Like, just stopping right there in front of everyone just because you aren't still moving doesn't mean and, and it's not like they they I don't know I mean I guess oh yeah couldn't they like radio something to some and yeah and just radio to someone and then someone picks up a radio and says commander Locke they're communicating with us what are they saying they're saying that they're gonna let Neo you know they they realize that it's Neo having you know but and then when they say that it's like are you surprised? You know, he's like, Neo, he fights for us. Of course he does. What did you think he... That's, that's exactly... He said he was going to fly to Machine City to stop the war. Did you think he wasn't going to fight at all? Any, you know, even... Yeah. But the... the you know, yeah, it's the ticking clock. Neo has to get to Machine City. The, the moment that he actually gets to Machine City, then... You know, the fight between him and Smith can take however long it needs to. But, you know, all that destruction, all that death, and then it just stops. It doesn't culminate, it doesn't lead to something, it just stops. The, you know, and the... You know, given that, you know, when when they, when Smith clones himself into Neo, you know, given the outcome, would it have been the same outcome if they hadn't fought at all? Like, I get that it probably, it wouldn't have, if, if he had done it before the Burley Brawl, it wouldn't have been the same, because he hadn't reached the source yet. He hadn't talked to the architect. You know, when he, the architect literally says, the process has altered your consciousness. Consciousness. So, yeah, you know, that needed to happen. But, yeah, 
are are both climactic fights completely pointless? Could they both have just, you know, the and yeah, it's just human beings just have to let it happen. The you know, let Neo go to the Machine City. Let Neo fight the Smiths. Since Deja Vu is back in this, you know, the, the same cat even meows the same as the IMDb trivia notes. This is a decent time to go into that the, the Deja Vu, as defined in these, doesn't really fit the, the actual Deja Vu. You know, the, the actual Deja Vu is when you feel like you've experienced something before and it's maybe like a long time ago or something but you know it's not when you see something and then immediately after you see the same thing that's not and it could have they could have used the real definition of deja vu in the first one during the rave scene maybe like right you know neo is staying there by himself and then trinity walks up how about right before that he like you know, yeah, someone is like drunkenly saying, maybe someone is being, you know, ushered out of, you know, of the club because they're being a little too raucous. It's like, you know, it's, it's a young raver and she's like, she's singing off key really loudly to, you know, maybe, maybe it's not even the, the, the song that's being played, you know, although drunken singing to Dracula might be fun, but you know, so so she's being ushered out, and he just notices that the same way he notices Ramakandra. Man, those three are stereotypical. You know, walking out of the the Merovingians' place in Reloaded. Then, when the rebels are entering the the building and about to leave, you know, he hears someone sing, and then he looks over, and you know, he sees that person. You know, or maybe he just. He only hears her, and he can't quite spot her, but he just hears her, and maybe he only heard her before, whatever. But he hears her, it's clearly the same voice, it's the same couple of words that he hears. Then he goes deja vu. That would have, that, that would have worked perfectly, because it's not like the audience is going to forget that. You know, it's going to be stick out, as you know, not stick out, but it's, you know, you're going to remember it as a cute little detail. Oh, not everybody can, you know, someone got too drunk. You know, and then when they hear it again, it's like, oh, hey, deja vu. And then, and then they explain, no, deja vu is this in the Matrix. But yeah, and you know, when when this movie came out, people, you know, had to decide which Matrix sequel rave did they hate more. But I do appreciate that. You know, as the philosophers also point out, it is kind of the opposite of the the Zion rave. You know, these are this is rich and decadent. It's it's not about the 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 fetishes. It's not the it's not kink shaming. It's not saying that this is bad. It's just saying it's free. You know, it's it's kind of you know a fetish is an indulgence that you can't really you know if if you're like working all day and Barely, you know, you're not going out and, you know, buying, you know, yeah, buying and wearing stuff like that. Because, you you know, when, when you come home, you just want to lie down and sleep. You don't want to put something on and then, you know, role play or something. Again, not saying that that's wrong at all. It's just, it's not something that you can do, you know, and... You know, as as a slave, which yeah, essentially, and you know the 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 movie actually the trilogy actually ends on a cheesy sunrise. It's it's ridiculous. I meant to say in the 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 video for the the second you know the the thoughts video for reloaded you know when 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 seraph has just fought neo 
he said, you know, the, the news jokes, oh, you could have just asked, you know, you do not truly know someone until you fight them. And, you know, I don't mind people making fun of that. I, I get that it's, you know, if, you know, if you take it to literally mean you have to beat someone up to know them, you know, that's, but you don't truly know anyone before you've been in a conflict with them, regardless of what you might think. You know, if you're in a romantic relationship and everything seems perfect, wait until you've, you know, been through something like like a money crisis or something. That's when you get to know that person. You know, your your parents, you know, the your your other family, your friends, whatever. You don't truly know a person a group, you know, no one until you've been in a conflict with them. I've read other parts of this franchise, the links are in the description box.